I will speak about national sovereignty and the global governance. As you see already, I put uh, versus. Two seconds. So I put versus uh, because for me that is not same direction. Uh, it has to be for some uh, uh, authors, but for me it is really not the same direction if you give up national sovereignty uh, and global governance. But to come to the state essential attributes, um, what is the state without sovereignty? On one hand, we have population. Uh, of course, we all know very good um, the population is really not important in numbers, in uh, quantity. So we have the countries like, uh, for example, Vatican, with uh, 1,000 citizens. We have some other countries like India or China with more than 1 billion. Other is territory. So it is really not important. Are you so, um, so um, how to say, uh, maybe to say small, maybe it's not fine to say small, political correctly, maybe not, but in reality small like Malta, or you are big like Russia, for example. <coughs> It is important to have territory. And the third dimension is sovereignty. The state without sovereignty, it's not state at all. That is the international public law. Without sovereignty, you can't be state. And that is some kind of tradition when we are talking about what are the attributes of one state. Recognition by other states means actually recognition by other that are already uh, on this position of sovereignty. If they don't recognize you, you can't be state. <coughs> we have a lot of territories with population, and to be honest, some of them have already, uh, already some kind of sovereignty but they are not recognized as the countries, as the state, because they are not under control of international public law. We can speak on, our, of course, uh, that's some kind of double standards. For example, one case was for uh, Kosovo, one case was for Abkhazia in Georgia. And of course, we can discuss what is actually the moment, why we, dis uh, why we recognize one type of the territories and not another type of territories. <laughs> because if you have all three of them, population, territory and sovereignty, then you have to be recognized, or maybe not. When, uh, when I am talking about sovereignty, I think on absolute authority that's called over the territory and population. Um, when we are talking about uh, people, when we are talking about population, we don't think only on the people that are in the moment in the territory of the state. So if you are, for example, a Croatian citizen, but you are on the holiday in Spain and you do something what is uh, not correct to do according to the Spanish law, you will be actually proceeded to Croatia, Croatia and Croatia will make decision about you. Um, that's, you have many treaties between different states how to hold that. According to my opinion, when we know actually what is sovereignty and what is the state sovereignty, that's my conclusion. No state has sovereign control in practice as increased in legal principles. So, we don't have really sovereignty, the full sovereignty of states anymore. Um, most of us thinking, of course, of course, it is not sovereign country, especially a, a lot of regular countries. Uh, but I'm thinking, for example, on America or Russia or UK as well. The full sovereignty, it's something what we can't reach anymore. When we are talking about actors, of course, the first actor is the national states. We are living in the period of national states community. Maybe we don't like that, but it's our reality. But in less decades, national states 
lose the part of their sovereignty by goodwill of the states or without it. When we are talking about goodwill of states, international organizations are made by sovereignty of sovereign decision given by the states. And states made decision to give one part of their sovereignty and join two different international organizations. If you are the member of different international organizations like the League of Nations, and we know all troubles of League of Nations, or maybe United Nations today, you accept all the documents of international organizations. That means actually, in advance, you accept everything, and maybe that is not really in your national interest always. Business groups like corpora uh, corporations, for example, they have very big influence in today's society. In some of them, states give sovereign rights, but for many of them, this is actually um, position in society without will of the states. Religion groups. We have the states, um, theocracies, that are actually states, but the religion group in those states is actually in charge of state. But in religion groups, I mean, we are talking about, we are talking, for, uh, for example, about churches and big influence of different, different churches and religion groups in different societies. Um, we have a lot of conflicts in different countries. Um, I will, for example, mention only uh, for us, in Sri Lanka. I don't want to mention oh, one. Yeah, exactly, Mommy. I wanted to avoid the countries where we are coming from. <laughs> so Sri Lanka was one of the countries where we don't have so deep connection in the moment. But actually, um, in China, for example, we have so many religion groups, they fight for their interests, their rights. And this is, of course, in direct contra uh, contrast to the national sovereignty of the domestic state and without will of the, those states. Media, influence of media on our national sovereignty, on the global governance is amazing. Especially last couple of years with the fake news industry, with everything what we have, and not only fake news industry, because we have enough uh, media influence without fake news industry, but with fake news industry, it's totally new dimension. Civil society, all NGOs, the influence what they have on today's society is probably in many cases direct contrary to the national interests of some countries, some states. Informal institutions. When we are talking about informal institutions, um, like um, Rotary, G20, G8, G something, uh, we have so many combinations of these informal groups. They don't have actually um, obligatory implementation of their resol resolution. No, only recommendation. But somehow, I think they are more influent than actually, for example, international organization itself. Decisions of G20 are very carefully read. What is their subjection? They are informal groups. Uh, individuals, position of individuals in today's society is very different it was 100 years ago. For example, in Europe, if you think that your country do something against your rights and your country don't protect you through the domestic law, you can go to the court, uh, European Court of Human Rights located in Strasbourg. 
and fight against your country, for example. That is today life. It's totally different life that was 100 years back. Of course, we have a lot of other actors. I will mention only one, this is military. Uh, when we are talking about military, uh, mostly we are always thinking, okay, look, military is the part of the state. And without state, military doesn't function. But in modern world, we have a lot of private military. That's the first. And second, you have a lot of uh, military cup in different countries. So military can be an independent actor of the state. In most cases, is the part of the state structure. But it is possible to have their own interest and to be direct against the state in some cases. When we are talking about this part of the transfer of sovereignty by will, so that the state really say, I really want to give a part of my sovereignty to one type is international organization, like I said already, United Nations or different other organizations on international level. But for us, it's really interesting to see what's happened with um, European Union. European Union is not international organization. European Union is much more supranational organization. The many countries join <coughs> to the project and give, by their will, the part of their sovereignty. Many decisions are made, actually, in the moment in Brussels by representative of those countries. But in reality, without full influence of the citizens, we have a lot of uh, trying after the Lisbon Treaty to make this influence of citizen much high on higher level. But in reality, we are very far away. Um, exactly uh, two days ago, Ankara Merkel, the Chancellor of the Germany, said something that is really important, I think. Nationalstaaten müssen heute, sollten heute, sage ich, bereit sein, Souveränität abzugeben. Uh, allow me to say that in English, nation states must be ready today to give up their sovereignty. Except Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that she has mentioned Germany in this context, but that was a sentence um, two days back. This sentence we can heard many times given by uh, President Macron in France. That is one of new trends in Europe. In reality, as a reaction of those kind of words, we have rise of populism and radicalization in a lot of countries in Europe. Because it is the question of sovereignty. Are you ready to give up sovereignty, your sovereign right to do something and to trust to some bureaucrats in Brussels? It's so easy to manipulate with that, with these feelings. For example, today is big discussion in Europe about uh, Marrakesh Declaration. Nobody read actually Marrakesh Declaration. It is about migrants, if somebody didn't read this. It's about migrants. But actually non-citizen read the carefully declaration, and of course he is not obligated to do that. But politicians are obligated to explain what is really inside of this declaration. But a lot of politicians use this non-information situation for populist rights, for populist votes in different countries. Brexit is one of example how to fight for more sovereign rights. Maybe on the end to lose sovereignty because we don't know really what will happen on the end with the Brexit. Which kind of Brexit we will have? What does the Brexit actually mean? We are really not sure. But it is not a problem that we are not sure. 
I think that elites of Brussels and elites in UK don't know what this actually means. It's not a problem if we don't know, but I, I'm afraid they don't know. Is the, the question of Brexit to have more sovereign rights or actually to lose this kind of sovereign rights? Because in the moment UK is in the position to negotiate again with Brussels, with actually 27 other countries, today Croatia is in charge to say to UK, oh, mm, we don't like that. No, no, it is not possible to put that. No, no, sorry. Croatia, a couple of years back, UK made a decision. Is Croatia ready or not ready? And, um, and today, Croatia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, all countries can make decision. And decision in the moment is actually Britain will stay in close connection to the EU, but without right to vote in Brussels about a lot of things. And you have to accept the rules without to vote. So you wanted to have more sovereign rights. That was the reason to fight. But on the end, you are in totally different position to lose sovereign, more sovereign rights than you have before. And one phenomenon, new phenomenon, and I will end with this, is the question of <coughs> illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy is actually all the phenomenon. It's not totally new. Uh, but it is actually new that some of the leaders in Europe say directly, you know, actually we are illiberal democracy. That's totally new. Many authors described different countries, especially in former Yugoslavia, I, uh, as illiberal democracy during the 90s. But none of those leaders said we are illiberal democracy. But we have in the moment new phenomenon that the leaders are proud to say we don't want liberal democracy. That's not our interest. We want to have something else, illiberal democracy. And illiberal democracy is actually fight for more sovereign rights for the state. Or to be honest, not to, for the state, for the elite of the state. And with this conclusion, I will calm down. Thank you. <laughs>